So be sure to grab your tea, grab a seat, and tune in to Miss Liz. Tea time, 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 making a difference, one cup at a time. Well, welcome to Tea Time. That's right, Miss Liz is back after a long month of May being off. And I have some incredible guests that are coming back in June. So be sure to check out Miss Liz's website at www.misslizisteatime.com. Now, before we get you over to the website, let's get you over to the YouTube channel, which is Miss Liz's Tea Times. If you haven't subscribed yet, get over there, subscribe, ring that little doorbell, and you can watch these Tea Times at any time that you want in your home when you're driving at a picnic you can listen to miss liz at any time now i have the incredible duncan brash Curran brown in the background waiting to have a good strong cup of tea with us today and we're going to be talking about top speed educational and amusement that's right the type of tea that we're serving here today so before we get started i want to give a special shout out to lebron's community supporter partner of best version media who is supporting this tea time for this month and his name is brian mcdonald so thank you again brian for that community support it is always appreciated now a little bit about my guests and and the disclaimer as you all know miss liz does and if you have any comments or questions or anything or support that you'd like to share, just put it in the comments and I'll get that into Duncan and he can see those and answer that during our conversation today. So let's get started with the disclaimer. Disclaimer for Miss Liz's Tea Time live shows. Miss Liz, myself, is going live using StreamYard. Before leaving a comment, please grant StreamYard permission to see your name at StreamYard.com. Please be advised that the content brought forward for any Tea Time show hosted by myself, Miss Liz, is always brought forward in good faith. However, may bring forward dialogues and opinions that are not representative of my platform. The facts and information are perceived to be accurate at the giving time of airing. All tea time guests and audience participants are responsible for using their good judgment and taking any action that may relate to the discussion. The content brought forward may discussions for some where they may be emotionally at risk. It's significant to know that the show is engaging in discussion forums only to offer and inspire awareness and connection and is not providing therapeutical advice. If you have any questions about the disclaimer or the panelist discussion, you may freely contact me, Miss Liz, through my email at bookingmissliz at gmail.com. Moving forward, should you choose to voluntarily participate in today's show in any aspect, I myself, Miss Liz, welcomes you. And should you decide that this show is not made for you at this time, I respect those wishes and will see you at a later date and a later show. Again, all tea time shows are hosted on Thursdays, 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you see it on a Monday or Tuesday, it's a rescheduled tea time or it's a surprise tea time that Miss Liz has found and just likes to throw those little surprises in once in a while. So now a little bit on my guests. Well, who is Duncan? Duncan Br Brashkarin Brown is a speaker, an author, and a Morris dancer. I wanna know more about that Morris dancer. He'll show you that you're getting over indulgence, can power up your productivity, push up your performance, and pump up the pleasure you take from life. Duncan has done his fair share of overindulgence. Strictly speaking, he'll, he's drunk more than his fair share of wine and eaten more than his fa fair share of cake. Along the way, he's found himself in some interesting places like on stage with the S Club, a sting as mayor of his hometown, and Moore's dancing in Westminster Abbey. After 20 years of overdoing it, he cleaned up his act and trained with the easy way clinic the world's most successful stop smoking service now he spends his time helping people push over indulgence out of their lives he lives in Ab abin john i'm going to get him to say it with one wife one daughter and two bonza 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 trees i'm going to get him to say that word too miss liz's tongue is twisting again let me get duncan in here and let's spill some tea with you guys <laughs> Welcome, Duncan. Hello, well, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I love a cup of tea. I don't want to be stereotypically British, but I do. So before we get started, Duncan, I want to get out where, where you're from, because I couldn't pronounce it right. 
So I live in Abingdon, which is Abingdon. nowhere near as famous as Oxford, which is just up the road from me. So um, I should probably just say I live in Oxford because I nearly do. And if you say you're from Oxford, people think you're really clever. Oh, well, look at that. I, I'm going to write that down. Clever. <laughs> So, Duncan, I want to get back into who you were as a little guy and who you are now as a grown guy. So who was the little boy and who's the grown guy? So I I, I struggled a lot when, when I was younger and I just I, I found it very difficult to find my place in life, shall we say. I didn't really fit in at school. Uh, you know, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the people at school uh, were very rude to me and bullied me. And pretty much that was just the teachers. And they, you know, they had expectations of me and I was never going to meet those expectations. And I had expectations of them. And uh, yeah, it. I guess you could say um, there was an occasion when I was asked to write a poem. And I know that most school kids don't get too excited about writing a poem, but I was jazzed about that. I was really into uh, Shakespeare at the time because I was one of the cool kids. And, you know, I, I, I really, I went at it and I wrote this poem and I really enjoyed it. I, you know, I, I, I really got into it and I took it up to my teacher and my teacher said, yeah, but, you know, the handwriting is awful. Your spelling is atrocious and your grammar is terrible. So I said, yeah, but that's not really important, is it? I mean, what's important about writing is, is, how you write it, what you write, you know, and I've used imagery and I've used sort of poetic language and I've really, really tried to capture the scene that I was describing. Surely that's more important than handwriting, spelling and grammar. And my teacher said, see me after school. And it was pretty much downhill from there. Um, you know, I just, I, I just, I did not fit into the mold that they were trying to put me into and I would not go willingly into the mold. So, uh, yeah, I was like a mixture of being kind of very, very confident and very, very nervous all at the same time. I like, I like people that don't fit in the mold, right? <laughs> there's enough people in that mold. There's enough people in that box. You know, let's bring the uniqueness out. Well, I, you know, I wonder whether we squash the uniqueness out of people by trying to fit them into that mold. I mean, I read something very interesting the other day about how NASA created this creativity test for their astronauts because they want their astronauts to be really, really creative. Because like, basically, if you're, I don't know, orbiting the moon and something goes wrong, you've got to think of a problem there and then. You've got to be creative, haven't you? So they devised this test and they tested their astronauts and they found their astronauts were in the top 1% of... Um, the, uh, you know, the adult population for creativity. And then just for a laugh, somebody gave it to a bunch of five-year-olds. And the five-year-olds, about 80% of them scored the same as the astronauts. Wow. And I just think, you know, that's the starting point. We are these kind of like unique expressions of humanity, very creative, very open-minded, very uh, curious about the world. And um, yeah, then what happens? Right. If you take all the creativity away, what do you have afterwards? Right. You, you have a bunch of uh, molds. You have a bunch of robots. What we're going into in the future, right, is all the same look and the same feel. And if we take all of that away, we're actually losing humanity. So yeah. it's really it's really uh, important that we keep the creativity going and the uniqueness going. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's basically a really fantastic idea if you happen to, I don't know, run a factory in the sort of late 1800s, then you probably do want everybody to be exactly the same and very uniform and, uh, you know, all turning up on time and all doing exactly the same thing all day long um, until they uh, die or retire, but probably just die. You know, that, that, was a, that was a fairly good model for education, you know, 150 years ago. Um, does it serve us now in, in, in the world that we're facing? You know, do we want everybody to be unique or do we need people to embrace their diversity and their difference and, you know, come up with amazing solutions to the problems that, you know, a lot of people hadn't even realized were problems. <laughs> right. <laughs> the problem's right there, but we're not paying attention. We're not awake. Right. We, we've really got to take those shades off and we've got to look sometimes. Yeah. Uh, 
so Duncan, I want to get into your books. Let's get into the first one. It's the top one. And I don't have the top one written out. So uh, let's get into the first one and then we'll get into Real Men Quit. Yeah, so uh, the first one was called Get Over Indulgence. And it really is my journey. And it does start off with, you know, little schoolboy me um, realizing that he's a pig in a chicken coop, basically. Um, so it starts off with me not really fitting in, but you know, it, it goes through my, my life and I, I found ways of coping with not fitting in. Uh, often they involved chocolate or other, uh, cookies or pizza or chips or anything like that. Uh, you know, that was what I started off with because, um, you know, I, I wanted something to distract myself, to numb myself a little bit. Uh, so I started off with food because it's a pretty socially acceptable drug if you're eight years old. Um, however, uh, once I discovered alcohol, I realized that was just a much bigger hammer for that particular nail. And I went kind of all in on that. So it's, you know, my journey uh, where that went and how it basically just sapped my energy and, you know, ruined my self-awareness and uh, spoiled the party, really. Um so it kind of takes you up to that point, but you know, that would be a rubbish ending to a book. So it also uh, goes into uh, what I actually did and how I got to, you know, health and peace and freedom and happiness and uh, joy and all of the good stuff. Well, and you mentioned indulgence of distractions, right? Because you started with food as a, as a young guy and then you went into the smoking and then to the drinking. We find distractions in this world, in today's society, right? To just try and fit in. And try and try to fill the void. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's almost like finding a space where there isn't any distraction. That's, that's right. the trick. <laughs> you know, there is like literally uh, in your pocket. You know, there's this wonderful rabbit hole into nothingness. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, I think it's part of this bigger problem that so much of what we do in life now stimulates us in this kind of like massive way that we're just, you know, our, our brains and our bodies are not really used to coping with. Um, and then we just, you know, we, we use this massive stimulus to distract ourselves. But all that does is it just makes us distracted. You know, it doesn't actually take us away from the pain. It takes us away from everything. So, if your default response becomes, right, I'm going to distract myself from stress, then that's, you know, that's not so bad if you're having a tough time with your uh, partner or, you know, you've got a difficult period at work or something like that. That might kind of work. But if you do it enough, if you do it regularly, if it becomes your default response, then anytime you have any stress in your life, your response is to distract yourself. So when you go and watch your daughter doing a ballet recital, you're going to be stressed because it's big for her. And, you know, you're going to be nervous. Probably, you're probably going to be more nervous. And when I say you, I mean me. Uh, I was more nervous than she was. Um, so if your default response to stress and nerves is to distract yourself, look, you're sat in the middle of one of your child's most important things and you're distracting yourself because that's what you do the whole time. And your brain is constantly thinking about whether you should check Facebook or your emails or play Candy Crush or watch Netflix or whatever, you know? Um, and you just, it just becomes your life. You just distract yourself during the good times as much as you do during the bad times. And it's something we don't really talk about is distractions, right? Because there's so many of them in the world. That, like you just mentioned three of them at a dance recital. You know, checking Facebook, playing a video game, you know, checking your messages. You know, we're not focused. We're, we're not getting focused into what's right in front of us. And yeah. the, you gave a good example, dance recital. And you were more concerned about the video game, the, the messages, the base, you know. Yeah. And I think actually, uh, you know, the thing that I've really learned going to my daughter's dance recitals is that, you know, she's at eight and all of her friends uh, that dance, they, they focus so hard on it and they're, you can just see the concentration and they're so totally with it. They're completely present. And I think that's our natural state as human beings. We are designed to be able to really focus for long periods of time on difficult things, to be completely present and to be living in that moment. I know 
for a fact that in a few years, when they all start getting mobile phones, that ability is going to get gradually worn away because that's what, uh, you know, tech does. It, it saps your ability to concentrate and focus and be present in the moment. And, you know, that's, that's kind of sad, isn't it? You know, we've got this amazing gift, you know, being a, a real live, genuine human being is an amazing gift. Yet, there's so much now in society stacked against us, making us, you know, devalue the gifts that we've got. Absolutely. You know, as we're having this conversation, Duncan, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, before we went live, I talked to you about being suspended from Facebook. And you know what? Like I told my son, maybe it's a blessing in disguise, you know, uh, taking that distraction away from Miss Liz so Miss Liz can focus on other stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, I... I... <sighs> I think you clearly can't uninvent technology. And I, I you know, I like Netflix. Uh, I do use social media. I, funnily enough, I actually use it to connect with people and to talk to people and often to arrange meeting them in the real world rather than, uh, you know, just to mindlessly consume stuff. Um, so I think it has its advantages. I mean, we don't want to go back to having to write people a letter rather than send them an email. But we need to find a balance with it. We need to find a way to navigate through the environment that we find ourselves in. And I think that really is the problem. You know, we, we, we need, basically we need two things. We need top-down solutions. So we need much better regulation from uh, the, the, the world of politicians. But of course, if you wait for that to happen, you're going to have a long old wait, aren't you? So we also need this bottom-up solution. We need to find ways to help each other to live, you know, more fulfilling lives by finding a way to navigate through all of this stimulation without drowning in it. Absolutely. And we keep going back to the dance, Duncan. So let's get into this Morris dancer. Like I, I've never heard of it. So what is Morris dancing? So Morris dancing um, is almost the complete opposite to my daughter doing ballet. Ballet is very precise and uh, very disciplined and very regimented and, um, you know, quite beautiful. And Morris dancing is folk dance. So uh, it's um, a little bit rough around the edges, shall we say. So, yeah, it's a kind of British folk dancing it's what if you picture um you know like the typical rural british uh village on the green you're going to have some guys they'll be dressed uh, you know in white uh they'll have ribbons they'll have bells they'll have flowers in their hats and they'll be waving some hankies and they'll be dancing to sort of traditional folk music um and uh yeah that that is what i do on the weekend so is that kind of like freestyling, like taking a handkerchief and just going with the flow of the music? <laughs> no. So, I mean, it varies from side to side, but the side I dance with is a very traditional side. So we, uh, the, the first mention of Morris dancing in the town that I live is sort of 1650 uh, something. So like, you know, 370 years ago so it's been going on for a fairly long time so we dance the dances that have always been danced give or take in in the town that I live in and there are other traditional sides like that and then there are people who have a bit more of a modern approach they take the idea they take the style and they kind of create their own dances so because it is a living tradition so um yeah but but in general you'll have um Groups of people, typically six, sometimes eight, sometimes two, and they'll dance a, a, a kind of prepared dance that they've all learnt. Um, somewhat similar to line dancing, I suppose. That's probably oh. a, a good analogy. Well, look at that. I'm learning something new. So is that only in the UK that they do that? Or is that... So, like uh, a, yeah, I mean... Okay. In, in one level, yes, absolutely. It's British folk dancing, so it happens. Um, and there are lots of different styles. You know, the, the one I do is from the Cotswolds, which is the, the part of the country I live in. But you also get traditions from near Wales, from the north of the country, from East Anglia. Um, so, and they, they, they vary uh, and they're, they're kind of different. That being said, you know, we have, <laughs> we have a, 
exported a few people around the world it, during our time. I think that's the the charitable way of saying we used to have this big empire. Um, but and as a result, you do find these kind of crazy uh, enclaves of folk dancing all over the world. So yeah, there, there's a few uh, Morris dancing sides in um, in America. Uh, there's some in Australia. You find them all, all over the place. But in general, it's it's biggest in Britain. And then, of course, if you take it one step further, I mean, folk dancing like literally happens everywhere, doesn't it? You know, wherever you find people, you find some some folk dancing and something that's um, really get, getting quite popular in this country is Appalachian clog dancing, which is, of course, um, from the Appalachian mountain region in, in America. And, uh, you know, it's weirdly this kind of folk tradition that sort of based on an English tradition that went over to the US, morphed, changed into something else and then has come back to the UK and we're probably morphing it a little bit and changing it into something else. So it's this, you know, wherever you find people, you find folk dancing, don't you? Well, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting because it's flowing to all the different countries, but it's originally from the UK, like, you know, British, British dancing. But all the other countries have taken a, a little twist on it, right? It's almost like anything else in life, right? Everyone yeah, yeah, puts yeah, their absolutely. little twist and turn on there, like the twisted T, right? Like we just kind of twist it around and, and we and we give it a new name. Yeah, yeah. I mean, ultimately, if you like pasta, you've got to be fond of that as an idea, haven't you? Because what is pasta? It's just Marco Polo forgetting how you're supposed to make noodles. Right. And some like it a little daunting and some like it a little mushy. Like, you know, everyone has their own flavor. It's that creativity that we talked about right at the beginning of the show. Right. Absolutely. Everyone has their different flavor and blend in there. So, Duncan, I want to get into your tea because your tea is pretty interesting that you gave me. You gave me top speed, educational and amusement. So why those three words, Duncan? So I, I the education and the amusement bit, uh, I, those for me, really, really go hand in hand. Um, I I think I've always mucked about quite a bit and therefore always tried to be a little bit funny. There's almost certainly some deep psychological reason, you know, what I'm compensating for, who knows. But um, for, for me, uh, you know, being funny is, is a part of who I am. And when I sort of got into um, adult education and training and coaching, I realised that it's a really, really useful tool and, and that if you can make people laugh they do actually listen to you because they want to hear the joke you know they they don't want to miss the next joke so they pay attention so it's you know a vital tool in my armory and I do you know I I see the world differently from most people and I I don't think I'm going to convince all of them in fact, I'm confident that I'm not going to convince all of them. But I think if I can help people to see things a little bit differently, not necessarily see them exactly the same as I can, I, I do, but actually to, to look at some of those things that are just so common and so ubiquitous that we almost don't even notice they're there. So that's the, the education bit. And then, um, you know, top speed, I, I kind of only have two settings. <laughs> You know, it's all or nothing right exactly it's either very very fast or or asleep and um you know I, i've kind of always been like that however when when i was at my worst really eating badly and drinking a lot and smoking you know the that <laughs> that single gear of going as fast as you can <laughs> got quite slow um and it, you know, my my life is really marked by being absolutely like that when I was a kid, just running around like an insane thing and doing a lot of stuff. Um, not all of it necessarily productive, but I enjoyed it. Um, and then this kind of gradual slowing down over a 20 year period of uh, my overindulgence period. Um, and then, you know, once I, I managed to get myself back into uh, the kind of condition that I should be in, you know, all of a sudden it's like it's back. And that ability to just be relentlessly enthusiastic and just have this, you know, can do attitude, you know, that's so important to me. And I, I did, I genuinely lost it. And I'm so glad that I've got it back. And that kind of, 
you know, that's why I want to help people to see things differently. Because a lot of the time, you know, people say, oh, well, yeah, of course I feel rubbish. I'm just getting old. And it's like, well, maybe. But have you ever thought that, you know, those eight beers you drank last night might have something to do with it? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Let's get into the word indulgence because I have a guest, uh, a, a, a viewer here, and they're asking the word indulgence. What does the word indulgence mean to you, Duncan? So indulgence is a very, very interesting word. So I, I don't like to be too aggressive. What I find is if you start talking about things like addiction and alcoholism, you know, it puts people off because that doesn't really gel with most people's experience. However, most people are quite, uh, you know, familiar what, with what having an extra slice of cake, maybe one more than they should have done. They're quite familiar with what that looks like. You know, the, the idea that you open that big bag of chips and you were only going to have, you know, a couple and then all of a sudden they're gone, you know, that's, that, that's indulgence. And there's nothing really wrong with indulgence. You know, I think that is something that you should do every now and again. I mean, I'm not a monk, you know, I don't, like I don't <laughs> live in a cell uh, sitting on a spike because, yeah, I'm like and eating nothing but gruel. You know, I do like to eat nice food and actually enjoy myself. I just, you know, I think we need to rebalance what the difference between the occasional indulgence and constant overindulgence. I mean, the example I always end up going back to is birthday cake. Now, unless you happen to have three and a half thousand friends, and I don't mean on Facebook, I mean like real, actual, genuine friends, unless you happen to have loads and loads of friends, how much birthday cake should you be eating in a year? What is it? It's going to be like 12, 15? You know, once you've got your, your close family and your close friends, you're going to be eating birthday cake once, maybe one and a half times a month, maybe twice if you're super popular. Yeah. And that is how for the vast majority of human history we would celebrate occasionally not very often every fortnight maybe only once a month um but now you get birthday cake ice cream and people eat it every day and we've totally and utterly lost the idea of using food and alcohol as a way of celebrating special occasions and now we just eat it and drink it because it's Tuesday, because Netflix is on, because, you know, we had a hard day, whatever. And, you know, it's sort of like understanding that indulging yourself occasionally is a very good thing. It's a very necessary part of life. But if you do it every day, it will become a problem and fairly quickly. Well, and you just mentioned something. We're losing the meaning behind celebration. We're celebrating 24-7 every day of the week. And then when we go to a birthday party, oh, it's just another birthday party. Oh, it's just another Christmas. Oh, it's just another Easter. We're, we're losing the feeling of these celebrations because we're doing it all the time. Yeah, no, I absolutely. I, I see it with, um, with, with the kids. You know, they turn up and they look at the, the food and it's just, well, this is like crisps and sweets. This is what I eat all the time. This is nothing special. Although, of course, when they come to my daughter's birthday party, they get cucumber and hummus and uh, they're like, wow, this really is special. I mean, I don't want to eat it, but. Uh... <laughs> right. Like we're, we're, we're having to make these weird menus and weird uh, decorations and games just to get people involved in celebrating yeah. again. Yeah, and I don't, you know, that's one of those things you, you you can get into this kind of like almost birthday party arms race, can't you? Like, well, I've got to have a fire eater because they had that. And then like, they've got to get the balloon molder as well. And then all of a sudden, all of the kids are arriving in helicopters. It's like, this has gone too far. <laughs> right? When is too much too much? Let's go back to the old way where we were celebrating a birthday and we were like, oh my goodness, what kind of games are we going to play? Like, Get excited. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, I, I, you know, I think that gets to the heart of it. You know, if you do it occasionally, it's exciting. If you do it every day, it's boring. And it's like, congratulations. You've turned your life into, you know, basically one of those old TVs that they had in the 50s that, where everything just seems black and white and grainy and the sound's not very good. Whereas, actually, you know, your life is supposed to be top of the range, 4K, plasma, HDR, and all of the other three-letter abbreviations that I actually don't know what they mean. But, you know, 
we just because we're constantly bombarding ourselves with sensations no sensation ever stands out anymore yeah and that's deeply important for you know for the listeners and the audience and who are going to listen to the tea time and the replay is we really got to start taking steps backwards you know and they say don't go back in the past we're, we're, sometimes we got to go in the past right to get to the present in order to understand the future if we just stay in the present and we just keep celebrating 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 we're going to end up losing the meaning of everything in life and it's just going to become an, a huge indulgement it's just going to come a big huge and i like that you use that word indulgence duncan instead of addictions because we we use that word a lot right we use addictions 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 uh you know recovery indulgence i i i haven't heard of it used very much in society and i think that it's like giving cucumber and hummus at a birthday party right it's different it's being unique and i think we need to bring that uniqueness back we need to bring those conversations back right and yeah absolutely and we need uh, we need more guacamole sandwiches those really did not go down very well but my daughter loves them so uh that's <laughs> Right. And a good cucumber is good sometimes. And Miss Liz looks like the matrix is coming for Miss Liz. Uh, can you still hear me, Duncan? I can still hear you. Yes. I'm, okay. I'm, I'm so I will figure out what's going on with the camera, but well, we're going to keep continuing this conversation. So we have a couple questions here for you, uh, Duncan, about the book called uh, Real Men Quit. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, I know this sounds a bit odd. But there is a part of the world where you don't find men shouting a, a lot. And I know we do tend to dominate the conversation pretty much everywhere. But the one space that we are really way too quiet in is uh, you, the sober sphere. So um, a, a lot of the conversation in the recovery world, in the sober world, is, is dominated by women. And don't get me wrong. I mean, I love them. You know, I think they're doing some amazing work. There are a lot of women doing doing really, really great stuff. And their stuff really resonates with me now. Now that I've stopped drinking, I can see it for what it was. But actually, I think when I was when I was drinking, I it, it wouldn't have struck a chord with me. It wouldn't have uh, engaged me because it didn't sort of like speak to my life. And as a result, I thought, well, you know what? Look, blokes we're not very good at asking for help. Um, so maybe books and podcasts are much more a, a kind of a bloke thing. We find it a bit easier. We can, we can buy it on Amazon and nobody really notices. So I decided to, to write a book specifically for men because while we don't really dominate the sober world, we do definitely dominate the alcohol world. So uh, the majority of problems with alcohol, uh, you know, happen to men. So men are two to three times more likely to have a drinking problem than women. If you look at the statistics, they're pretty bleak. So uh, if we went to a bar, um, you know, and there were four drinks on the counter, as a man, I'd have to drink three of them. And as a woman, you'd have to drink one. And that's not just me being like uh, bravado or anything like that. It's simply the fact that, uh, you know, 75% of the alcohol consumed worldwide is consumed by men. Uh, as a result, men drink around 19.6 liters of pure alcohol a year, which put in real terms, translates to about three and a half bottles of wine a week, which is way, way too much. So we are definitely leading the field when it comes to the problems, but we're not really engaging with the solutions and we're not really talking it through. So uh, yeah, I, I decided to, to do my bit on that. And um, I wrote a book called Real Men Quit, which is you know, it's it's aimed at men and it's full of the kind of things that men like. So there's a lot of sport in there. There's a lot of James Bond, a bit of Star Wars and an awful lot of really, really bad jokes. So, uh, yeah, it's um, it's my contribution to to solving that particular problem. And it. Oh, you're back. I was just going to keep talking because uh, I could go on for hours. But... Well, and that's why I love my guests because my guests just keep doing their thing, right? They they keep talking. they they know the routine. Uh, so, uh, 
just continue where you left off, Duncan, and I will pick up from there. Uh, yeah, so um, I was just sort of explaining why why I wrote the book and how it's designed to um, help men who have way, way too many drinking problems but aren't doing very much about it. So, uh, Duncan, the, the title of the book called Real Men Quit, when I seen that, I was like, okay, how do men look at this book with that title? Without even knowing what the book is about, how do they look at that? So I I think there's one of two reactions. Well, no, maybe there's maybe there's three. I look, I am completely aware that some guys, you know, they're not going to engage with it. They're not interested. They don't want to think about quitting. Uh, you know, they're not they're not there yet. They're not ready. Um, a whole host of reasons. And usually they're just going to take the mick out of me. And that's absolutely fine. If you want to be rude, be rude. I don't care. Um, I'm a big boy. I can take it. And then there's another set of people who, you know, I think um, it, it does resonate with because they sort of get the idea that, well, actually, we've been told for years and years and years that real men drink. And that, in fact, it is quite a macho and manly thing to do. And, uh, you know, it is. Well, I mean, if you're not that good at sport and you're, you're not like a big, good looking hunk who's, uh, you know, a devil with the ladies, then what have you got to prove your macho, you know, to prove your your masculine credentials? You've only really got alcohol. So uh, for a lot of guys, it is the way that they prove that they're a real man. Um, so it's it's a deliberate kind of play on that. And it, it resonates an, an awful lot with, with many of them because they kind of, you know, almost after three words start to feel that, yeah, actually, you know what? that was a load of rubbish and it absolutely is a load of rubbish. Um, and you know, <clears throat> I, I'm quite happy to get into what I would describe as, uh, you know, what makes a real man, but alcohol really plays uh, no part in it. So, um, yeah, it, it gets a variety of, of, of reactions. Um, yeah, it's, it's generally positive though. Well, when I when I seen the title of the book, I was like, oh, this is going to be an interesting conversation because of just the title without even knowing what, you know, because you call yourself the so a sober warrior coach. So I knew what the book was about. But I mean, for the ones that don't, didn't know what the book was, I was like, oh, this is an interesting topic. How did you come about taking that name for this book? Well, <clears throat> I... So I'd had it in the back of my mind that um, I really, really wanted to write something about the mechanics of stopping drinking. So I'd, I'd written about, uh, you know, kind of like the a little gentle nudge as to why you might want to look at your drinking. Um, that's what Get Over Indulgence was, was, was all about, really. And, you know, look, looking at what my next project was going to be, I was thinking, well, I want to write something about you know, that, that's much more how than why. Um, and then hanging around uh, the places that I do, I realized that it had to be for men. And at about the same time, I wrote a, I, I wrote, I didn't write, I read a very good book called Quit Like a Woman, which um, is an excellent book. Um, uh, but again, you know, probably wouldn't resonate with most men, kind of designed not to. Um, and I thought, oh, yeah, I put quit like a man. No, no. Uh, but then, like, at some point, it just sort of popped out of my head, real men quit. And I thought, well, that's that's great because it is kind of a little bit in your face. It's a little bit confrontational. Um, and it runs contrary to, you know, the prevailing philosophy that we have in this world. Uh, you know, I think we're we're constantly being told that if you've got a problem, you've got to add something. You know, if you've got a headache, you need an aspirin. If you're unhappy buy a new car you know it's all about adding things adding things you want a better job get more qualifications you know it's all about adding and adding and adding but actually you know the secret to a lot of happiness and health and success is actually about taking stuff away so you've got to ask why have you got a headache well you know maybe because you're drinking so much coffee you're dehydrated take away the coffee 
allow your body to rebalance itself and the headaches might well go, you know, like obvious caveat, I'm not a doctor and, you know, uh, it could be a brain tumor. But um, in general, uh, you know, removing stuff can be so beneficial for your health. But it also, you know, it can just be um, beneficial for life in general. You know, I, I think we we buy a lot of stuff and we cart this stuff around with us. I know you leave it in your house, but it is almost like you carry it with you and you have all of these things. And do they bring you happiness? Half the time they just bring you worry because they don't work the way you wanted them to work or they, you never use them or they just cost a lot of money and you're still paying it off. And, you know, actually you would have just been a lot happier if you didn't buy it in the first place. Um, and sort of like understanding that, you know, many of the problems in life are about what you take away, what you don't do, rather than what you add. So yeah, I'm absolutely trying to reclaim the word quit and uh, get, uh, you know, get people to realize that, that you know, quitters win. Right. And quitting sometimes is a new chapter, right? A new story, a new beginning. We really looking at words, and and that's why I use words for T is because we look at words as a, a certain way, right? We hear the word trauma, and we think, oh no, this is going to be, but trauma is needed in life. We need the good, the bad. We need to find that circle of change and removing stuff. It's like it's like we talked about the celebration, right? We celebrate all the time. Now we don't know how to celebrate, uh, you know, and. It's like everyday life. We get up and we do the same routine every day. But the first thing we do is we grab our phones. We start checking our messages. Start check, And we forget about what's really in front of us. So we need to start removing things from our, from our lives in order to yeah. move on. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right about suffering. You know, honestly, everything that has, is of any value in my life has caused me a lot of problems and it's usually the result of you know intense suffering to get to that point and we sort of think well you know we want life would be perfect if we eliminated our all of our problems but you got to realize life is the problems that's like <laughs> my daughter you know i love her and everything but she is a problem i mean she's like constantly licking lamp posts and stuff like that and you know like you've got to kind of like make sure that she goes to school and stays alive and eats food and stuff like that and uh, yeah i mean she causes me a lot of problems but of course if you took her away then like that would be a whole different set of problems yeah. So it's not about eliminating problems as such. It's not about living a life without suffering. It's about making sure you've got the right kind of pro problems and your suffering has meaning and your suffering helps you to grow and helps you to d develop. It's not that your suffering is something that you try and numb yourself against. You try and distract yourself from, you know, because that way you don't learn the lesson and it generally never gets dealt with. And those problems just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, and that's the thing, right? The pot just gets bigger and bigger and then it overflows. And then we're like, oh, well, how did this happen? Well, I'm not sure. We just kept filling that pot up and the pot can only hold so much. And then it makes a mess. And then it's like, oh, now we got to really look at it. And where we could have handled the problem in stage one, we're handling it in stage seven. You know, we ourselves can be the problem at times because we don't look at at the picture that's in front of us. Yeah, I mean, so many of the people that I've met, you know, they started drinking because they have problems. But in the end, they ended up having problems because they were drinking. And, uh, you know, that ability to actually stand in front of them and, and confront them, yeah, it's, it's countless people, they just say, do you know what? I, what was I running away from? You know, it seemed so huge at the time. It's kind of like, uh, you know, you see this big monster, you know, against the wall. It's like this huge shadow on the wall. And you think this is a terrible, terrible monster. But what you actually realize is it's just a mouse. But it's just the shadow always looks bigger. Um, and that's the experience that not everybody, but a lot of people I know who've stopped drinking, they, you know, they were running away from something, but they never got any further away from it. They were just running around it, really. And then once they stopped running and had a look at it, they realized it was not a zombie or the CIA. You know, it was it was a mouse. Duncan, I want to get into the smoking because smoking is just as bad as drinking. Right. 
it, it's the addiction and it's hard to get away from it but i love that you use the word indulgence instead of addiction because addiction is so overrated right it's so overused it's just like the word love i when people say love i'm like can you guys not say appreciate or you know i, I care i adore why do we have to use the word love all the time you know and for you you're using the word indulgence instead of addictions and which i really think is different and it might save someone's life by using that word instead of the addiction because they might be scared of that word addiction yeah although that's another curious fact about society isn't it we don't ever talk about nicotine addiction you know not really we never say oh he's a nicotine addict that one sort of like sneaks under the radar a little bit, doesn't it? Um, and certainly, yeah, I, I just vape every now and again. Oh, I'm not a nicotine addict or anything. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, smoking. And I think it, it's, it is only really fair to talk about smoking and vaping because they are basically the same thing. Now, people might be going, oh, yeah, well, vaping is not as bad for you as smoking. And it's like, well... Yeah, but that's not an incredibly high bar. I mean, there aren't that many pe things in life that aren't as bad for you as sm that are worse for you than smoking. I mean, what are we talking like plutonium and asbestos? Yes. Like, <laughs> so, yes, I agree with you. Vaping probably isn't as bad for you as smoking. But if you think of smoking as repeatedly hitting yourself in the head with a hammer, if you start vaping, all you're doing is buying a smaller hammer. You're still hitting yourself in the head. And I'll tell you one thing. I I help hundreds of smokers a year. And now that's transforming into a lot of smokers that stopped smoking and started vaping. Um, so somewhere between 20 and 50% of the people, that the sessions that I run will be vapors now. Um, and I tell you something for free. They hate it as much as they hated smoking. And so most people, their problem with smoking is not really the health aspect of it. Um, it's not really. I mean, that's what they'll tell you the big issue is. But when you really get down to it, when you really pick into it, what they hate about smoking is that it just controls them. It just runs their life. They, they, they can't plan anything without working out when the next cigarette break's coming. Um, and vaping is exactly the same. I mean, arguably, it's kind of worse because, uh, you know, you can sneak it on the uh, on, on the airline if you're really, really clever. Um, you can maybe even do it in the office. Uh, it's a guy the other day was saying to me, um, when he first started vaping, he realized there were like four conference rooms in, in his office. And if he was careful he could you know switch between the four of them and it, the smell wouldn't get too bad but now he's vaping so much that he was running out of conference rooms to, to vape in um and that's it it's that control that it takes over you uh that's what people hate about it and people who vape talk about it in exactly the same way as people who uh who smoke cigarettes you, you know it is the the mental imprisonment as much as the, the physical ill health that it causes that, that they're really, really concerned about. So yeah, maybe vaping is not quite as bad for your health as smoking, but it's bad enough. And anyway, nobody really knows because nobody's been vaping for 20 years. So we don't really know what the effects are, but like somebody was talking about, you know, uh, vaping apparently causes a condition called popcorn lung. Now I don't really know what that is and I am not a doctor, but, I I don't want popcorn lung. It does not sound good, does it? <laughs> well, I'm not a big popcorn eater, but the, you, you, there's so much side effects to it. But it, it comes back back to that silent, hidden addiction, and you know that we don't speak about, and the indulgence of hiding it, the distraction, right? Is we're doing it, and we don't even realize we're doing it sometimes. Because I'm a non-smoker and I'm around all smokers. Everybody around me smokes except for myself. So I feel like the oddball and I'm just like, okay, so what, what is it about cigarettes that you guys like so much? What is it about the vape that you like so much? I'm trying to understand. Oh, and okay. So <clears throat> there is an interesting, well, as you're interested in language, you'll love this one. So there is this interesting uh, thing about smoking, I suppose. So if um, if you drunk too much alcohol, you would be, what word would you use to describe somebody who's had too much alcohol? An alcoholic. Uh, no, no, I just on a single occasion, you know, oh. they just had a few too many at a party. You'd say they were? 
a drunk. Yeah, they, they were drunk. And if somebody had smoked some marijuana, you would say they were? Stoned. Stoned. If they'd taken some cocaine, you'd say they were? High. Yeah. If they've smoked some cigarettes, you would say they were? <laughs> there is no oh, word. Oh. In, there is no word in the English language that describes the effects of smoking cigarettes. And you've got to admit that, um, you know, we have a lot of texture and detail when it comes to describing the effects of drink and drugs. You can, you know, you can really kind of William Burroughs it if you if you want to. There is a there is an awful lot of vocabulary to describe that. Um, so it's a rich and textured language that that totally lacks any way of describing the effects of smoking. Why is that? Because there are no effects of smoking. <laughs> it is only the bad stuff. You just get a cough and it makes you tired and it costs you a ton of money. And then people stop talking to you because you smell bad. You know, there are literally no positive benefits uh, to smoking, which is weirdly, it makes it just about the easiest thing to stop doing because <laughs> like, it's such an easy sell. Like, think about it for all of 10 seconds, you know, name the advantages of smoking. And, you know, people will say, oh, it, it helps me to socialize. And then as they're saying it, they'll realize that actually it's quite antisocial having to go outside and generally smelling and, you know, and they'll go, oh, it helps to reduce my stress. And then about 30 seconds later, they'll realize that actually a significant proportion of their life, the stress in their life is caused by smoking, <laughs> you know? So, um, all of these kind of like reasons that people give, they're just terrible justifications. There is no benefit. I mean, I'm not a fan of alcohol, I'm not a fan of cocaine. I'm not a fan of marijuana, but at least you get something. At least it alters your mood. <laughs> right. I, I, I've always tried to understand that because I'm the oddball that everybody's outside enjoying each other and I'm the one inside by myself. And then I go outside and then everybody comes in. So I'm just like, okay, like what is going on here? Like, should I have a cigarette with you guys so that you know that I can stick and have a conversation with you? Uh, I'm, I've always tried to wonder that, Duncan. And you know, so this is basically what happens when you are a teenager, um, you know, somebody will will give you a cigarette and you'll smoke it and it will be absolutely vile. But because you don't want to like seem like you're not cool, you go, oh, yeah, this is really great. And like you, know, you get, actually get groups of teenagers. They all hate it, but they're all trying to impress each other. And it's a little bit like the Emperor's New Clothes, isn't it? You know, they can all see it, but nobody really wants to mention it because they don't want to be the one that says this is blinking awful. Why are we doing it? Yeah. Um, and all they've ever seen is adult smoking. They just completely connect adulthood with, with smoking. So they all do it. They all try it. They all hate it. Um, and before they know it, they've, you know, they've got hooked on it. And um, they now have this kind of small physical need to do it, which translates into a larger mental issue. Not so much the physical thing, but the ability to manage that kind of those triggers and those cravings or whatever you call them. Um and before they know it, you know, it's just something that they're doing 20 times a day. But, you know, trust me, you're not missing anything. <laughs> you really well, I, missing for, for all my viewers out there, yes, Miss Liz did smoke. I smoked for three weeks of my life and I kept choking on it. And I finally I said, I, I, I don't like this. It's not giving me any good feeling to it. So I just don't want to do it. Uh, but I have smoked three weeks of my whole entire life. And, and I just watch everybody else smoke around me. And I'm just like. I don't know. Yeah, is well, that what you guys feel like you you're just too scared to say like you know what? No, I'm I don't want to not fit in. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a little bit of I, I think to start off with when people start smoking, they they stick at it because they don't want to be seen as the odd one out, or they don't want to sort of they think everybody else is really loving it, and they'd be a bit of a freak if they said this is blinking horrible. Um, that's to start with, but I think the reason why people stay trapped is there is a lot of sort of incorrect beliefs around it being quite hard to stop smoking. And that if you do stop smoking, you've got to be miserable or you've got to turn into some kind of like anti-smoking evangelist. And I think that happens to people um, because they don't necessarily go about it in the right way. So, you know, if you're in prison, you, you've got two choices, haven't you? You can do the you can do what I like to call the Andy Dufresne, 
which is basically steal a teaspoon from the canteen, spend eight years like banging away at the wall and, uh, you know, then break into a sewer pipe and uh, swim out from the prison in the sewer pipe and you will get out of the prison. But, you know, it's pretty horrible and you end up covered in, well, sewage, don't you? Uh, that is one option. The other option is just getting a key <laughs> and walking out of the prison. And it is so much more pleasant. Uh, you know, it is so much easier. So if you are trapped in something, there are there are different ways of getting out. And people do get free just using nothing but but willpower and white knuckles. But they end up hating it and they end up miserable and they end up covered in the proverbial. Whereas if you actually just, you know, meet some people who kind of understand behavior change, um, understand sort of cognitive reframing or cognitive realignment, then actually it makes stopping smoking uh, not completely easy, but relatively simple and relatively painless experience. I, I mean, to put it very, very briefly, what most people do is they concentrate on the action. They think that behavior change is about changing your behavior, but yeah. it really is not. The behavior is the thing that you should ignore. What you should start with is your beliefs. You should look at your beliefs because your beliefs underpin everything that you do. So you've got to ask yourself, you know, like, why are you smoking? Um, does it really reduce your stress? No, it's causing your stress. Does it really help you socialize? No, it makes you stink and it makes you antisocial. You know, is, is it really giving you all of these benefits that you're pretending it's giving you? No. Once you've got to grips with those beliefs, then you need to work out how to manage the thought process. So you are going to be in situations where, um, you know, you'll see people smoking and your brain will go, oh, let's have a cigarette. Because over tens, if not hundreds of thousands of occasions during your life, you have taught your brain to think in that situation, have a cigarette. So, of course, it's going to do that. So you need a process to, to manage the thoughts, to manage the cravings. And once you've got, you know, the beliefs in the right place and you've got the thoughts in the right place, then the behavior follows. Yeah. The problem is, as I say, a lot of people do it the wrong way around. They start with the behavior and they hope the thoughts and the uh, beliefs catch up. And, you know, one in a hundred times, maybe they do. But uh, mostly, um, you know, it does not work that way. So, Duncan, if anybody wanted to reach out to you and, and learn how to quit smoking and get your books and all that, how can they reach you? So the easiest way to uh, find Real Men Quit is just go on Amazon and type in Real Men Quit, which are three pretty easy to spell words. So, uh, you know, that that shouldn't even challenge, uh, you know, the even if you've maybe had a drink, you could probably manage that. Um, so th that's Real Men Quit. If you want a copy of Get Over Indulgence, I'd love to um, share a copy uh, with your listeners uh, so they can download that for free on my website. The easiest way to find that is because, you, you know, they're not going to be able to spell Baskaran Brown, are they? So uh, <laughs> if you just put getover.uk into the internet, that's getover.uk, that will take you to a little bit of my website. You can download the PDF or the Kindle version, or if you can stand listening to me for three hours and 45 minutes, you can download the audio book, and I will apologize now for the silly voices. Um, but go to getover.uk, and, uh, you know, that is my gift to you. But it's also, uh, it will take you to my website, and then you can, um, you know, you can find out about all of the stuff that we do. Uh, I'm pretty busy on the socials. Uh, always happy to connect with people. Always happy to answer people's questions. You know, even if I can't help you, then I'd love to point you in the direction of somebody who can. Well, and you have an amazing podcast as well that people can tune into if they'd like to hear you as well, correct? Yeah, yeah. It is a little bit niche. So it is aimed at people who um, have already stopped drinking um, and... It's born out of my total obsession with two things. One, what is it that keeps people sober? Because like, as I was saying about smoking, you know, I think stopping drinking, so long as you go about it in the right way, the stopping bit is pretty easy. You know, beliefs, thoughts, actions, easy. Uh, however, staying stopped is a bit more of a challenge. So I got obsessed with the idea of what is it that keeps people sober? So I started interviewing sober superstars. And then I realized that, that, that I should just record them and call it a podcast. So uh, that's obsession number one. Obsession number two is Ikea furniture. So there's a lot of weird um, Ikea things going on in my podcast, uh, which is why it's called Flat Pack Sober, 
We always ask the guests at the start how they build flat pack furniture and then uh, plug that into our proprietary algorithms and then work out, uh, you know, how they uh, approach life based on simply how they assemble flat pack furniture. And I do that because I think there's so much advice out there that, you know, it's presented as this is the truth. If you don't do this, you're an idiot. This is absolutely the only way to do it. And what people who say that really mean is this is what worked for me. And if it works for you, then great. But I think you've kind of got to understand that there's a lot more to it than that, that not everything works for everybody. You know, uh, I was just talking to a guy who is absolutely mad keen on journaling, thinks it's the greatest thing in the world. And for him, it is. I can't get on with it, though. Uh, just not going to, it's just not my thing. Um, and I, I think the options that you have is kind of beat yourself up because that's not your thing. And you, you know, you, you can't get on with it or realize that you probably can't get on with it because it just doesn't suit the way you assemble flat pack furniture. I mean, live your life. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Duncan. It was a pleasure sitting and having tea with you, you know, and, and stuff is not everybody's cup of tea, right? It's not my thing. It's not my cup of tea. That and that's how I always tell everyone. Uh, I really had a pleasure sitting with you, Duncan. And thank you all the viewers and listeners who have tuned in and left your comments today. I've seen you. Thank you to Savage uh, um, Unfiltered. He, I guess, I was on Tea Time a couple seasons back. I want to thank you for supporting that today with our Tea Times. And I really want to get everybody over to the YouTube channel again before we wrap it up. Check out Duncan's YouTube channel. Check out Miss Liz's YouTube channel. Give those little bells a ring and give them a, a feel. And if it resonates with someone, share it with someone because sharing is caring. And that's how we really make a difference with our cup of teas. I will be back tonight with returning guest Roger Leslie. And he'll be talking about his new book called No Strangers Christmas. Uh, it's going to be an interesting one. Uh, so I will see everybody until then. Stay tuned and keep serving your teas. Miss Liz is watching and I'm paying attention and you never know, you might be the next tea on Tea Time with Miss Liz.